Yes. We're good, we're good to go. Okay, thanks, Jacob. Uh, listen, I wish I could see all of you. Wish we were in person, but uh, this this will do for now. So good morning, and uh, thanks again, Jacob and, and colleagues. It's a pleasure to be with you on behalf of Canada's uh, chemical and plastics producers. And I just uh, want to start, I guess, build a little bit on what Jacob said, just to situate the sector uh, for you within the energy value chain. Uh, broadly, uh, chemistry plastics, the broad field of chemistry and plastics, it's about a $90 billion a year industry in Canada, and that makes us Canada's third largest sector. Uh, relating to energy, and Jacob uh, is right, we're a very important component of the energy value chain. And for instance, the sector consumes nearly or around 20% of total Canadian natural gas flows each year. So it's a, it's a major uh, a major customer and a major part of that value chain. And in doing that and consuming that natural gas, uh, the sector adds tremendous value to those energy resources. So for instance, taking the natural gas, extracting ethane, turning it into ethylene, turning that into polyethylene, you're looking at more than a seven to one net value add over that uh, initial natural gas. And if you're talking about propane to propylene, uh, even a little bit higher than that. So uh, then if you take some of those products and you go on to make, which we do in Canada, additional consumer or industrial products, of course, you're adding multiples uh, beyond that, uh, some high, very high value finished products at the end of the day. Take a minute here, I'm just going to situate how the sector came out of 2022 and what we're looking at in 2023 and then uh, come back to a theme I've heard a few times already and I'm sure I'm sure we'll be hearing a little bit more about it. If we look at uh, 2022, the sector did end the year uh, with record value of shipments that's that's in terms of the value, the dollar value of shipments and the volumes almost caught up to 2019 28 uh, pre pandemic levels. So all in all. Uh, a very good year for the chemistry, Canadian chemistry and plastics sector. But uh, probably more than most sectors in the economy, chemistry is very heterogeneous. And so when you look at those, uh, you know, not nationwide or sector wide numbers, it masks a lot of discrepancies. And certainly in 2020 and 2021, uh, the plastics components, ethylene, polyethylene, uh, extremely uh, robust. What we saw in 2022 was the, the very important chloralkali sector catching up. For instance, it was up nearly 30% over 2021 levels. And meanwhile, due to the continued shutdown in China, uh, significant new capacity additions in North America, we saw the important resin and rubber sector off nearly 10%. So overall, very strong year, uh, but it, you know, again, it, that doesn't mean everybody uh, participated in the party. When we look ahead to 2023, certainly the outlook for everybody uh, at this point is murky. We would say it's cautiously optimistic, at least for Canadian producers and North American producers. We do expect to see uh, by year end uh, total growth somewhere between neutral and plus 5%. Again, you'll see some subsectors do very, very well and others uh, a little less so. Uh, we think growth will continue, it, it will be sustained, we will have continued growth, but prices are going to face some headwinds and, and that's especially true with the new production that has reached market and it's uh, very soon to reach market. So uh, cautiously optimistic that and, and I think one of the things that makes us optimistic is announcements like we heard from Dow uh, Chemical yesterday and, and others in the sector, uh, they are very disciplined. They're responding very aggressively and uh, you're seeing uh, announcements, not just from Dow, but from others to rationalize uh, older, less productive, less efficient assets. And unfortunately for, for those in Europe, uh, that's where you're gonna see a lot of rationalization in, in the chemistry sector. Uh, on the other side, that bodes fairly well for lower cost ethane based natural gas liquids based producers like we have in Canada and uh, throughout North America. Maybe just touching a bit on those major expansions, Canada is about to participate in that party. Uh, we didn't last year. We have two very significant projects that are imminent to reach commercial operation. Uh, they've been under construction for five years now. And between the two of them, they total uh, nearly $8 billion of incremental investment. And importantly, those are the first two major material incremental investments in our sector since 2001. So this, this is a big deal. 
And the first of those that's uh, very, very close to being fully in uh, commercial operation is the Interpipeline Heartland Petrochemical Complex in uh, Alberta. That facility, once it's complete, well, it is complete. Once it reaches its, uh, its uh, milestones for commercial operation, you're looking at an additional 500,000 tons of new polypropylene entering the market. And similarly, over in Ontario, we have the Nova Chemicals Corona facility. Uh, they've ended construction. They're well into commissioning. Uh, they expect that by mid-year, they will also be in commercial operation. And you're looking at an additional 400,000 tons of annual uh, incremental polyethylene entering markets. So that's great news for Canada. You're going to see some major bumps. In fact, by year end, once the year end 2022 data is out, uh, uh, you will see uh, considerable increases, um, especially I, I believe the interpipeline facility was somewhere in the area of uh, uh, 100,000 uh, pounds of, of production towards the end of the year. So you're going to start to see some of that entering the market very, very quickly. Looking ahead, and again, I think there's a theme we've heard and you're going to hear throughout the day is the possibilities and the challenges for where the sector goes next. So I think I mentioned this last year, we've seen uh, a significant change though. Um, you know, we, we currently are tracking uh, more than 20, more than 20 chemistry sector investment proposals, largely publicly announced on the basis of very aggressive uh, investment attraction efforts from the province of Alberta and the province of Ontario. You know, not all of them have a dollar value associated with them yet, but you can estimate that in aggregate, those uh, four, 20 projects are probably valued at over $40 billion of potential incremental uh, expansion in Canada's chemistry sector. That, that's a big deal, right? Um, those, uh, those projects, they range, you know, we're talking about tripling the production at the Dow Fort Saskatchewan site. We're looking at battery chemical projects by BASF and Beconcourt, Quebec. There's a range of additional projects that would be incremental methanol production. You've got a number of projects in Alberta that are proposed as um, ammonia production, but the ammonia uh, converting natural gas to ammonia and the ammonia being a, uh, let's call it a hydrogen energy carrier uh, to be exported to Asia and offset uh, coal-fired electricity production largely. So that's really good news, and the especially exciting news is every one of those 20 projects, every single one of them is tied into the low carbon net zero economy. And so for most of the projects in Alberta, you're talking about hydrogen production utilization, and you're also talking about carbon capture and storage. Uh, turning to Quebec, of course, uh, key destination for, for some of these projects because of the uh, low, uh, near zero uh, electricity uh, emissions intensity. So that's fantastic. Here we are again, we're talking about a major expansion to our third largest manufacturing sector. We're talking tens of billions of incremental investment. We're talking about every one of these projects being net zero, low carbon from initial operation. That sounded great. And then last summer, we had uh, the announcement of the US Inflation Reduction Act. I can go into details if there's questions. I'm sure most of you know it, but let's just be clear. The scope, the materiality, the certainty, and the transparency of access to those investment supports is forcing every one of those investment proposals, those proponents in Canada to revisit uh, what they're doing and look at it from a due diligence perspective and in interest of their shareholders. And I assure you, without a meaningful response from the federal government, no matter what the provinces have done to level the playing field, those projects will not go forward. It, it's just impossible. And I won't even talk about the ones that aren't publicly announced, but the notes I get from my members every day saying, hey, look at this internal correspondence. We propose this project, solar energy, hydrogen. Here's the answer from, from our headquarters. Great project. Not a chance, <laughs> not even close to the economics available in the US. So this budget 2023 is certainly shaping up to be the most um, material budget, probably since we back in the days when, when we were talking about free trade for Canada's industrial and the chemistry sector. Everything's at stake, right? If we don't 
meet the challenge in the US, these projects don't go ahead, the investments go there, Canada misses out, and we're stuck with assets that continue to be emitting while the competition not only builds newer, larger, more efficient, more productive, more profitable assets, but also low carbon. And the outlook for that 10, 15 down, years down the road is not very positive for Canada. So very important that we see uh, the federal government make a very meaningful response to that. Uh, you know, just again, the scope of the, the IRA, whether that's renewable energy investments, whether it's hydrogen production credits, CCUS credits, supports for battery manufacturing, like all these things, Canada has to step up and, and be uh, material in, in, in its uh, interests to help transform sectors like chemistry. So Jacob, I'll stop there and happy to respond to any questions. It doesn't seem like there's been many this morning, but uh, happy to, as you wish. Thank you. Um, I, you know, learning about uh, carbon capture use sequestration, how it feeds into potential development of a hydrogen hub in Edmonton. We're gonna have them join and speak to us a little bit later and, um, and what good that can do for, for the chemistry industry. Um, always sees with the idea that an advantage apparently we have in Canada on the carbon capture is uh, our geology. In uh, the Edmonton region, we have great um, uh, uh, substrata for storing carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, and apparently we also have an advantage in uh, the management of uh, the substrata. Uh, we, it's a little bit easier to create these because the mineral rights are by and large owned by the province and we're able to do that. So that's always touted as an advantage for us. But uh, from what I'm hearing from you, even that advantage uh, pales in comparison to what we're seeing from uh, from the IRA in the States. Am I right? Well, there's, I think there's two things. <laughs> uh, Canada certainly has a feedstock advantage, right? So why are these projects here, whether it's natural gas with natural gas liquids, we do have an advantage even over the US Gulf Coast. Uh, when it comes, but they're not far behind, right? It's, it's pretty tight competition. But when you look at uh, the CCUS, certainly uh, some would say that Canada has uh, the second best, Western Canada, the second best opportunities for geological carbon storage anywhere in the world. Well, guess, guess what number one is? <laughs> the U.S. Gulf Coast. So the geology is about equal, maybe, you know, the feedstock about equal, we're on equal terms. Certainly, we do have experience, as they do again in the Gulf Coast. That's something you didn't mention. Yes, we have the geology. Yes, we have the policy framework. Jurisdictions like Ontario are way behind on that. Yes, though, we also both have experience. So then you're left with, well, what's going to make the difference? And I'll just share an anecdote with you from, you know, one of our member companies that we had into C Finance. And they said, okay, you've got a proposed investment tax credit. The U.S. has an investment tax credit. Let's just compare these. Our analysis as the association said that before the IRA, what Canada was proposing was worth about half of the 45Q. After the IRA, we said Canada's proposals were worth about a quarter. Uh, one of the member companies we sent into finance, they did side-by-side -side detailed comparisons. At the end of the day, they said what Canada's offering is worth one-eighth of the US. The scope, the coverage of machinery and equipment covered by the US is significantly bigger. The size of the credit is significantly bigger. Oh, and by the way, if you want to do enhanced oil recovery, that counts, but at a discount. But here's the real thing that's the real difference, right? So you're in a company, you got a proposal in Alberta, you got a proposal in Texas or Louisiana. The one you can model right down to the last dollar, the value of that tax credit, what's it going to cost you to put in CCUS? In Canada, you have no ability to do that. And why? Because it's not transparent and it's, it's not at all clear. What do I mean by that? The current proposals, of course, in Canada is you're going to have to have a ministerial approval to access the CCUS investment tax credit. And as I say to Finance Canada all the time, I'm sorry, but a tax credit that requires ministerial approval is not a tax credit. It's a government spending program. And the value of that is until the day you get it. So when you're putting your business case together, everything in the U.S. is transparent, predictable, certain, and everything in Canada, at least at the federal level, value zero. So despite the heavy work, I mean, Alberta 
petrochemical incentive program is worth almost 12 percent of, of of a project value and it's certain it's transparent that's why you've got all these proposals but ottawa's ottawa's quote assistance has zero value when you require a ministerial decision so i'll leave it at that there's a lot of other factors but uh, that's that's ultimately what's uh can is up against the scope uh the materiality but most importantly that transparency and certainty and if if nothing else, that's the one thing they have to change in budget 2023. It must be certain and transparent, whatever the value or counts for zero.